Okay, so welcome back to week two of isomerism. And this week we're looking at the relationship between optical isomerism and how uh, it can help us work out which mechanism the reaction is doing. So in this video, we're just going to start off by looking at the SN1 and SN2 mechanisms for the nucleophilic substitution of an OH negative ion onto a halogenoalkane. So I'd like you to take your time over this. Make sure you're happy with all of these. I'm going to include some uh, other web links that you can go and have a look at, but you need to be very confident with SN1 and SN2 mechanisms before we move on and look at the role of optical isomerism in these mechanisms. Okay, so we're on the top of page 11 of your notes and we're going to complete task two this week. We're looking at uh, the relationships between optical isomerism and mechanisms. In particular, we're going to be looking at um, what we call the nucleophilic substitution mechanisms and the nucleophilic addition mechanism that you studied in the carbonyl pack. Now we're slightly out of order in this um, because you should have already studied this in the halogenoalkane pack, but we've only just started that. So um, we're a bit out of order because of we haven't been doing any practicals. But I'm going to go ahead and have a look at what we call the SN1 mechanism. And this is a mechanism for um, us replacing an OH group onto a halogenoalkane, so taking off the halogen and replacing it with an OH group. Okay, and we're going to do the mechanism for this. This is an SN1 mechanism. That means it has one species in the rate determining step and it usually works with a tertiary halogenoalkane. So we're looking first of all at this SN1 mechanism. So overall, we're going to take our halogenoalkane, which in this case is 3-bromomethylhexane. So we have a CH3 group on the end, and then we have another carbon, here and then we have our carbon with our Br group on it and we also have the same carbon with a methyl group on it. We've got six carbons in total so I've got another carbons on this side to make six in total and that then is going to react with some sodium hydroxide and we're going to replace the Br group there with an OH group. So this is a substitution mechanism and we're substituting uh, a bromine in this case for an OH negative. And we're kicking out the bromine and the other product we get is obviously sodium bromide. Now we need to look at the mechanism for this reaction, how this actually works. So the carbon I'm interested in is the carbon with the Br group on it. I've got a CH3 group. I've got this carbon, these two carbons here. So I've got a C2H5 group and I've got a C3H seven group there. I'm not really interested in these two groups, so I'm just um, drawing them as non-displayed formulas. Now there's a dipole on here because the, the bromine is delta negative, the carbon delta positive, because the bromine is more electronegative than the carbon, and some molecules will have sufficient energy that they will vibrate hard enough that that bond between that carbon and that bromine can break, and at that point the bromine has come loose, it's floating over there somewhere, and we get what we call a carbocation being formed. C3H7, that should be a 3. Okay, so this is a carbocation. It's a planar, and that's important, carbocation. Then that's my first step, and that's what we call my slow step. And then there's a second step, 
which is my BR, sorry, my OH, which is the one I'm adding, my OH negative, my oxygen has a lone pair on it, and that is joining on to that carbon, and we get our alcohol. And I've still got the rest of the skeleton exactly as it was before. H so there. So I've now made my alcohol. This bromine is still loose. So that's my overall mechanism. This is the first step. It's a slow step. And this is a fast second step. It's called an SN1 because there's one species here in this rate determining step, this slow step, which is the first step of this mechanism. Okay, so the second mechanism we're going to look at is the SN2 mechanism. This generally works best with primary halogenoalkanes, and we're going to react two bromopentane with sodium hydroxide again. Okay, um, it can work for secondaries as well, so it works for secondaries or primaries. So I'm going to draw out two bromopentane, and I've got my BR group here. And the rest of my hydrogens can just go on as normal. So this is obviously a secondary. Sometimes secondaries react via SN1, some via SN2. But I'm going to call this one reacting by SN2 mechanism. So I've got some sodium hydroxide again. And again, it's a nucleophilic substitution mechanism. Where my BR on that second carbon is being replaced by an OH group and I get pentan 2 ol as my organic and obviously I also get some sodium bromide. Okay, again I'm going to draw the mechanism. So I have my carbon with my bromine still, I have a hydrogen here I have a CH3 group and I have this C3H7 group as well. Now this time two things happen simultaneously. My OH negative, it's lone pair, still got this dipole on here, this is still delta negative, this is still delta positive. I'm still going to break this bond but as I said, two things happen simultaneously. The OH group goes in as this group comes out. So it's this OH group pushing in that forces this uh, electrons out. Now, instead of getting an intermediate, we get this funny looking thing called a transition state. So we have the BR group leaving from one side and we have the OH group coming in from the other side and we have the rest of the groups just arranged as normal. So I've got my CH3 group, my hydrogen and my C3H7 group. Now it's a transition state. It's still got to balance charge wise so there's a negative charge in there somewhere. It's transitioning from the OH group to the BR but we're not quite sure where it is in that molecule at this particular point. So we're just going to put it on the outside of the box. Remember this thing inside the box very very unstable. As I said this is called a transition state. Carbon is trying to cope with five bonds. So generally speaking, it's very difficult to catch the carbon doing this. We're looking at uh, femtoseconds, so very, very small amount of time um, that this species exists. So this is not an intermediate. This is a transition state. And that's why we put it in a box, because you can't catch it. Eventually, that group will come in, that group will out. Do be careful of the orientation of this OH group. Make sure it's the oxygen pointing towards the carbon, not the hydrogen. The two key errors that students make on this are one, not having this orientation around the right way, and secondly, not having the negative charge on the outside of the box. Those are two things that are going to cost you the most marks. But then again, we get an alcohol as my product. And again, I've got CH3 
and I've got C3H7. And again, my BR negative has come loose. So notice it balances charges all the way along. OK, so for SN1 reactions and SN2 reactions, there are two things we need to consider. First of all, the stability of the carbocation, and secondly, what we call steric hindrance. So we're going to look at the carbocation version first. So we know, we should remember, that tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations, which are more stable than primary carbocations. So the stability... increases as we go from primary to secondary to tertiary. Therefore, for an SN1 mechanism, if we made a carbocation with a primary, it would be very unstable. But a tertiary carbocation is quite stable. So that's one reason why tertiaries undergo an SN1 mechanism, because you have this stable carbocation intermediate being formed. If I try to do an SN1 mechanism with a primary, um, I would again have to form a carbocation, and that would be very unstable. So the second reason is, as we said before, steric hindrance. This is basically big bulky groups getting in the way. And they explain this very nicely in the video. But if you think about a tertiary carbocation that is surrounded by large R groups and quite a large halogen atom, trying for my OH group coming in to actually be able to attack that carbon is very, very difficult. So we've got a large amount of steric hindrance. We've got lots of big groups surrounding that carbon. So the nuclear file is blocked from attacking it. However, when we turn it into a carbocation, if you remember, we said that this was a planar shape. Planar means flat, which means this OH group can readily attack this carbon positive ion. Whereas with primary halogenate alkanes, these two R groups here are replaced by hydrogens. Hydrogens are very small, so they're not going to block the OH group from attacking. So those are the two reasons. The stability of the carbocation, where the tertiary carbocation is very stable, so that helps the SN1 mechanism. And steric hindrance, where having large groups around the carbon we're trying to attack, limits the um, the SN2 mechanism. Okay, so that finishes looking at the SN1 and the SN2 mechanisms for primary and tertiary halogenate alkanes. And we've gone through a bit about why primary halogenate alkanes undergo an SN2 mechanism, whereas tertiary halogenate alkanes undergo an SN1 mechanism. In the next video, we're going to be looking at optical isomerism and the role that it plays in determining which mechanism predominates. But that's all for now. Take care. Bye-bye.